Hello and welcome to the Genuine Learning Blog. My name is Melissa Galasso and this week we're going to pick up where we left off last week, which is looking at the quality management proposal. So day, today we're going to cover part two, which is SQMS2. So the uh, actual proposal is one PDF, but it has three different exposure drafts within. And so each week we're going to take a look at an individual section. So this week, we're going to talk about SQMS2. Uh, and this one is really new. Uh, this does not exist today. Uh, and it is a proposed statement on quality management standards. So instead of, again, quality control, consistent with last week, it is quality management. Um, but this one's on engagement quality reviews. This is a little bit different than what we currently do because today it's actually in the squash uh, section or in the AUC section and they're calling it out and giving it separate attention, giving it its own standard. So similar to what we discussed last week, it was issued February 4th, comments are due June 11th. So a long time uh, because we know that right now many of you are knee deep in busy season and are not able to really respond right now, but we do wanna keep you up to date. And so this is part of the alignment with the international uh, auditing uh, group. So we're looking at their QM project as well. So when do we use this proposal? Uh, so this applies to all engagements, not just audits, for which an engagement quality review is required to be performed. Now remember, this is coming from SQMS 1 because SQMS 1 says the firm has to identify appropriate responses to quality risks. And so this is a specific response that you can design and implement by the firm as a response. So it is not mandated. It continues to allow flexibility. The firm can decide which engagements require an engagement quality review and what the criteria are going to be as a response to the risks that are identified in SQMS 1. Um, but if you have to, if you have identified identified as an engagement quality review as your risk response, then this is going to apply to any engagement. And so not just audit, it could be an AUP, an examination, a review, or a comp, anything to which you are going to require it under your quality management system. So one of the questions that they uh, kind of address in here is why is this separate? <laughs> why aren't we just including this today? It's in QC 10 and AUC section 220. Um, and they really wanted to provide more robust information than in the extant standard. And the concept behind having a quality review is really it addresses a lot of the regulator beliefs that if you're going to have that strong public interest that this is a great option. So they wanted to really pull it out. Uh, so it does clarify again, that's not just for audits for any type of engagement. So having that separate standard helps. It places emphasis on the importance. It's got its own standard. That's how important it is. Again, it enhances the robustness, uh, robustness for eligibility and documentation. We're not gonna cover a lot of documentation today, but the standard does cover exactly what has to be documented when a quality review happens. Uh, it helps also understand what's the firm's responsibility versus what is the engagement um, partner's responsibility and the reviewer's responsibility. So they do kind of break those out. And then it allows for scalability instead of including it in QC10 or sorry, which would now be SQM uh, S1. This concept here is going to really basically say that maybe you don't have any engagements that require a quality review. It wouldn't be bulking up the uh, the standard, right? It's only gonna be in here if you need it. So if you don't determine that anything requires a quality review, then it's, you wouldn't need this chapter. Uh, so it's a scalability concept. So we did talk a little bit about this concept, oops, <laughs> this concept of a public interest. So uh, many people believe that a quality review does enhance that concept of uh, quality uh, in, in an engagement. And so consistent performance of quality engagements is in the public's best interest. And so having that cold review does help improve quality. And so that's one of the reasons behind it. So one of the things that they have framed here is they frame the objective as being of the firm. So remember last week we talked about how they had two different objectives that they were addressing here in the quality uh, in the quality review section. The reviewer is really acting on behalf of the firm, and so that's the objective and how it's written. And so the objective is an engagement quality review is an objective evaluation of the significant judgments made by the engagement team and the conclusions reached thereon. And so again, this is 
outcome oriented. It's uh, when you look at the requirements and how they describe them, they're not, uh, they're talking about the desired outcome. They're not going over like an executive summary of the actual requirements. Uh, so they're really just focusing on what they want to have happen and then how you get there is going to be a lot of professional judgment. It does clarify though that it's not an evaluation of whether the entire engagement complies with the standards and regulatory requirements. We're not saying that they have to look at every work paper, uh, every item. Again, it's going to be those significant judgments made uh, and the conclusions that are reached. It's not gonna be a total review. So we do get some terminology here. So your engagement quality reviewer is a partner, so specifically called out, or other individual in the firm, uh, or an external individual appointed by the firm to perform the engagement quality review. We do see a lot of outsource Q, uh, you know, QC today, which will be QM going forward. And so they continue to recognize that it does not have to be internal, especially for smaller firms who don't have that capacity. You can have an external QM process. They do remind us, however, that the engagement quality reviewer is not a member of the engagement team. That's to help pr uh, protect that objectivity. Uh, and it doesn't change the responsibilities of the engagement partner. They are still responsible for the overall quality of the engagement. Uh, this is just a risk response to ensure that happens. So there are a list of requirements. You'll notice again that they're more outcome driven. Uh, make sure you have policies and procedures that require certain things or that address certain things, but they're not gonna tell you what to exactly you have to go through. So you have to have policies or procedures that require the assignment of responsibility for the appointment of the engagement quality reviewer to individuals with the competence, capability and appropriate authority to fulfill this. So someone has to be able to identify who can be a quality reviewer. And so that could be the managing partner. It could be if you have a quality uh, group or a risk group, uh, it could be a professional practices group, but somebody or someone, you know, a group of people have to be able to decide who can and cannot be a quality reviewer and what those competence requirements are going to be. And so that's going to be specific to the firm. There's not a one size fits all here. So it's up to the firm to establish policies and procedures that describe for the firm who that who's going to qualify. They also have to um, indicate, so, oh, and this one again is going to be who has the responsibility for the appointment, then who's eligible, right? So the first piece is who can decide who is eligible, and then what does it mean to be eligible? So the firm has to establish policies and procedures that sets forth the criteria for eligibility to be appointed as an engagement quality reviewer. So once we know who's allowed to decide who can be a quality reviewer, now what criteria are they gonna benchmark them against to determine whether they can be? Uh, so it's sort of a two-step process, and again, it can't be a member of the engagement team because of that objectivity. So what are some of the qualifications that we're gonna ask about? Competence, capability, time. I know as a former QC person, and that's part of what I did when I worked in national office was second reviews and concurring reviews, time was always really fun. Uh, and so obviously trying to balance what I had responsibilities for with what the engagement partner and team needed is always a big, uh, you know, you wanna make sure that's a proper balance there. You don't wanna push this through. We also don't wanna hold up uh, important deadlines. So it's definitely a balancing act. So competence, capability, and time, as well as the appropriate authority. Again, they don't require that it be a partner, says, and other individuals, but does that person have the ability to make the engagement partner change or do something? Because if they don't, that's a problem. They also have to comply with the relevant ethical requirements, including that objectivity and independence. This is one of the key reasons why we have a quality review and complying with laws and regulations. One of the things that they do kind of um, point out here is that uh, their procedures should be uh, pr um, performed at appropriate points in the time during the engagement to provide an appropriate basis for an objective evaluation. It does not have to be at the end of the engagement. In fact, when some of these decisions are being made, it might not be a bad idea to bring the engagement quality reviewer in uh, to make sure that you can concur before you go do this audit and they come back and say, no, nope, I don't think you had the right scope or no, nope, I don't think that was the appropriate risk assessment. So it is at appropriate points in time. So it's not just at the end, you have to kind of encourage that participation, but not too much participation or else you might lose that objectivity. 
So what does an engagement quality reviewer do? Well, they read, obviously, starting point, and obtain an understanding of the nature and circumstances of the engagement, what areas required significant judgment. They discuss those matters and judgments in planning, performing, and reporting with the engagement team. They review selected engagement documentation. So the firms are gonna have to decide what documents or what work papers need to be reviewed as part of this. They evaluate the requirements related to independence to verify that the team really is independent and whether a appropriate consultations took place, again, thinking about the standards, but also about firm-specific policies. In addition, if it's for an audit, they also have to evaluate the basis for the engagement partner's determination that they have been sufficiently and appropriately involved. So that's one of the requirements in the standards that you have to be involved. Has do you, Can you have evidence here that they were appropriately involved throughout the actual audit? And a different uh, kind of uh, inclusion here is a notification. So you have to notify the engagement partner if you have concerns about the judgments made, the conclusions reached. Uh, you're also gonna see a notification that I finished this. Uh, so there's a little bit more in that documentation here, but if we don't agree, then we do have to talk about it, right? So we have to address that. And we mentioned earlier, objectivity is one of the big features here when we're thinking about this standard and having an objective reviewer. And so you have to have policies that address the threats to objectivities when the individual being pointed uh, was formerly the engagement uh, partner, right? So you can't immediately roll off the as engagement partner and become the engagement quality reviewer. In fact, they require a two year period or longer for what they're calling the cooling off period. Now, they did consider a couple of options here. They considered no cooling off period with just application guidance, a one year and a two year. Ultimately, when they put this out for exposure draft, they decided to go with what's in the international SQM standards, uh, which is two years. But they do now informally include a two year uh, cooling off. Uh, you can see some of the same stuff that you, you would see here from the PCOB, et cetera. So uh, if you were the previous engagement partner, you can't immediately become the quality reviewer because of that objectivity. Remember, some of the decisions you make are gonna be consistent year to year. We want some fresh blood, some new objectives here. Um, and if you have uh, another requirement in your policies is that you have to address the nature and extent of engagement team uh, discussions with the reviewer about significant judgments that might give rise to the threat of uh, to objectivity. So if they are so involved and they're making a lot of decisions and there's a lot of issues, then they might not be objective when they get to their ultimate review because they're so involved in the nature and the extent of these discussions. So it is a little bit of a balancing act. We want to incorporate them uh, at the appropriate points, but we don't want to impair their objectivity. So we want to have policies and procedures that really address how do we preserve the objectivity of the quality reviewer. And then have policies uh, that address when the quality reviewer's eligibility is impaired and what actions should be taken. So for example, if you've been appointed and you haven't started the quality review and you've been really involved in the day-to-day -day of the audit, you can just decline the appointment. Or if you're sort of in the middle of it, you can discontinue the performance and then you would have to have policies on, okay, who's going to identify and appoint the replacement at that point in time. Uh, in addition, the engagement partner is precluded uh, from dating the report until notification has been received from the engagement quality reviewer that the review is complete. So again, you have to have formalized documentation that they've completed their review, at which point you can now uh, date the report. You cannot date the report until then. There was a lot of discussion on dating of the report as well, which you'll see in the proposal. Other things that are addressed in the standard that we're not gonna go into too much detail, but um, individuals or assistants who assist with the engagement quality review. So you might have a engagement quality review partner, but they might have a manager who's assisting in that review. How do we uh, verify some of the requirements for them? How do we incorporate that? And uh, we see this with a lot of the bigger firms. I don't see it so much with smaller firms, but it is addressed in the standard. So consistent with what we talked about last week, we have a proposed effective date. However, this is the earliest effective date that it would be. Uh, they do say that at this point, they would have to you know, see how this shakes out in terms of comment letters and any changes have to be made. Uh, it could be delayed a little bit uh, from the actual dates here. So again, for audits or reviews, it would be for, per uh, for periods beginning on or after 12, 15, 23. Remember, that's because we have financial statement dates. For other engagements like AUPs, you don't have a financial statement. It would be for um, those engagements beginning on or after 12, 15, 2023. And they kind of describe beginning as either the start of the engagement letter or performing procedures, whichever is 
earlier. So when we talk about the beginning, uh, if you're engaged uh, first, then obviously that's the kickoff. If you start procedures and then you're engaged, which we don't recommend, then uh, obviously it would be when you start performing procedures. All right, so that's a wrap again. Uh, this is a lot of detail uh, going into a, a brand new proposal, but definitely one that we want to make sure that you're aware of. Thank you guys so much for joining me today, and I hope to see you on a future blog. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.